This is Scriptural Pursuit with your host, Glenn Russell. In class recently, a student asked, what is a prelude? We then discussed the definition of a prelude as a short piece of music which often introduces themes that are part of a larger musical piece. We've all heard various musical preludes, though we may not have recognized it. Some of the most familiar ones are by Johann Sebastian Bach or Frédéric Chopin or Claude Debussy. There's also literary preludes and artistic preludes. They serve as kind of introductions to a larger artistic work. The Gospel of John begins with a prologue. Well, it's not the same thing as a prelude, but has some similarities. It's a fascinating beginning to this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Welcome to Scripture Pursuit. I'm Glenn Russell, your host. Today we continue our series exploring the gospel of Jesus according to the book of John. So glad you joined us for our discussion today entitled The Prologue to the Gospel of John. Now we're delighted to welcome our guest, Pastor Michael Taylor. Michael, glad to have you with us. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. And Michael, you're serving in ministry out in uh, the state of Montana. Is that correct? Wyoming. Wyoming, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Near the same part of the country. Near the same part of the country. Uh, we are uh, blessed to be... Uh, it, my joke was, it feels like the middle of nowhere sometimes, but uh, it was really nice to to have a special uh, gathering with some of my friends with the International Camp Re just just down the road last month. And so it was nice to see, or, uh, you know, over the summer, uh, it was nice to see some friends from, from all around the world coming together here in Wyoming. Very good. So welcome, Michael. Glad to have you with us. And I uh, just want to remind folks, you can listen to previous programs on the WAUS app, or you can watch them on YouTube. Just uh, search for Scripture Pursuit on YouTube. There's several hundred uh, episodes, and they each have an exploration of God's Word. Now, before we go any further, uh, let's begin with prayer. Let's bow our heads together. Lord, we ask that as we open your Word, we ask that you'll open our hearts. Uh, Father, we we have some ideas, we have some things in our hearts and mind, but but we need to be teachable. We need your spirit to come. And most of all, as we look at this powerful prologue to the Gospel of John, we want to see Jesus. We want to know Jesus better as our Lord and as our Savior. May this be our experience. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, Michael, maybe the first thing for us to do would be to do a little bit of reading of the text of the passage. And... Uh, so I'm going to read verses one through five, and then if you would like to make some comments on that, uh, that would be wonderful. Um, okay. John chapter one, verses one through five. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There's a lot there. Let's take that first verse. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I hear echoes of Genesis. In the beginning, I, God created the heavens. Is this the same beginning? Uh, that's definitely what John intended, I would say. Uh, th there's strong connections when you hear that phrase in the beginning that John absolutely wants his audience's ears to immediately tingle and think of of creation and going back to the very beginning of of this earth and, and humanity. Uh, so when I hear that phrase, uh, myself having uh, gone through the Bible a uh, handful of years ago for the very first time, I, I started the very beginning of the book and uh, I didn't have any Christian background whatsoever. And as a, a non-believer, when I saw those words in the beginning and then continued through the Old Testament, when I ran across them again in, in the Gospel of John, to me it was like, hey, this is this is going back to creation all over again and, and framing it in terms of Jesus and uh, showing us that he was a part of the story going back to the beginning. And it seems to even hint to earlier than creation of this world. So obviously, uh, when, when you see this idea that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, uh, the the implication here is, yes, there's there's a connection to creation, but 
God is eternal. The idea that there was a God, this is the earth's beginning, not God's beginning, because God has no beginning. He is the eternal, infinite God. And uh, the the way that John writes this, it makes it, uh, makes it crystal clear that even before there was an earth, there was a God. And mm. Jesus, Jesus is a part of that conversation. So however far back you want to go in time, and <laughs> put a pin there and say, that time God already existed. And Jesus right. already was God. At, uh, as a parent with several young children, we have a fun time trying to explain to them that there never was a time when God did not exist. Mm. And they, <laughs> they're, <laughs> uh, yeah. that, that's, but to me, that's also one of the great hopes and one of the great promises, uh, because I also think of another one of John's another one of John's works that we have in our Bible, the book of Revelation. And when we see in Revelation chapter 13, a reference to the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, when we go back to creation and we think of the idea that Jesus, he didn't die at creation, but before there was, and creation was originally good and very good, but before, uh, before sin entered this world, before things turned bad and we had to deal with the evils that you start to see references to, uh, you see references to darkness and the people later on in this passage, they just can't comprehend the light. Well, one of my great promises is before there was a sin problem, there was already a sin solution. Mm -hmm. And so I think of Jesus taking on that role as, as savior alongside his role as creator. And he just only had to wear one hat at the moment, but he knew that other hat was ready to go. And if there's no beginning, there also will be no ending. God yeah. is eternal. And uh, now, now, Michael, there are those who, who accept Jesus as a great religious teacher, uh, you know, maybe even a prophet, maybe a holy man, but not God. John oh, seems to set out the, a clear statement here right at the beginning. Now, this idea of word, uh, do you want to explore that a little bit, this idea? In the beginning was the word. Uh, I, I was going to say that idea of Jesus being just just a great man and just a great religious teacher. Uh, John definitely refutes it. I also think of contemporary uh, theologians like C.S. Lewis, who refute it too, when he brings up his famous liar or lunatic or Lord argument. You can't say the things that Jesus said, and you can't say the things that the Bible says about him and just leave him as a great man. The, the, there's no room for that. So mm -hmm. when you look at this idea that John is, is connecting him to the word, uh, you have uh, where God speaks, and it comes into existence uh, several times throughout the the Old Testament, uh, throughout the the Bible. There there are uh, these these phrases that the word comes to people. God's word came to them and spoke to them. And so uh, you get this connection to the Jewish audience of um, you get the connection to the Jewish audience of God speaking and it coming into existence. But uh, it's not just God speaking, but now it's God's. God himself making these things coming to existence. On the flip side, you get the the Greco-Roman. You get to deal with the, the pagans and the outsiders who had philosophical views, who had to deal with reason and had to deal with logic and philosophy, who also used that same Greek root word, which was logos. And, Jesus, or, and John here is saying, it's not just an idea, it's a man. Mm -hmm. So the word or logos is not some intangible, vague truth, but rather a divine human reality in the person of Jesus. Right. That, that's that's how I read it in this passage. And I think that's what John was definitely trying to to show to his to his audience, especially when we see down at verse 14 in this passage, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Yeah. That's a very, very clear statement of an incarnation, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. Uh, and this isn't one that comes out of the blue. Uh, the idea that he dwelt among us, uh, the Greek root there has uh, basic root meaning is tented or to, to set up a tent with us. And it's been recognized my readings and, and other readings that I was doing to prepare for today to be able to try to keep up with, with the conversation with you, Dr. Russell. Um, uh, the idea uh, strongly connects back to God setting up the sanctuary in his mm. uh, in the wilderness with Moses, going back to Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8, when God said, I want to build a, a sanctuary so I can dwell with you. And so 
you have that same thing. It's not just an idea, but it's a person. Uh, because for the Jewish people, they needed this this connection. Unfortunately, the idea of God and what God wanted from them, it just wasn't working for them. And and God had to do something a little bit more drastic than anything he'd ever done before, I'll say. But drastic in a good way. Yeah, and, and this idea that you're bringing out about God said, let me tabernacle or tent literally with you. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for us, we think of tents as camping, temporary. Mm -hmm. But let's remember, they were camping all the time. So he really is saying, I want to come and reside with you. I'm going to mm -hmm. be with you. I'm not just making a short-term visit. It's not just a, a temporary thing. I want to come and be among you. And it is absolutely remarkable that the eternal God could become a human being. I mean, we're used to that idea, but it's still mind-boggling. Uh, the divinity, you know, some of us have a hard time realizing that Jesus actually was a human being. Back in the day when he was walking on this earth, they probably had a hard time understanding that he was divine. Mm -hmm. So he's both human, he's both divine, but he has to veil that divinity when he becomes a human being. He doesn't give it up, but he's monogamous. He's, you know, one of a kind. Right. It's, it's, an incredible revelation of who God is and uh, what what he wants to be with his people. Uh, I, one of the things I appreciate is though he is king of kings, though he is divine, when he comes to earth full of power, full of wisdom, full of all of these things, uh, oops, uh, what I see here, uh, he, the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Hmm. He doesn't set himself apart as aloof. He doesn't uh, hide himself from people. He doesn't make himself uh, unapproachable. In fact, all of the opposite. We find the Jesus who, representing God, wants to have that relationship, that intimacy that he had with us back in the beginning, going back to creation, uh, that he originally had where he could be with us. And unfortunately, that sin problem came in, that that separation uh, that has torn us from God and, and God from us. Uh, Jesus came to uniquely be able to bridge that gap and to make us whole again. Let's focus for a moment on this expression that it says, you know, he he was begotten. There's a reference to that here in the text, that Jesus was begotten. And that has led to some some misunderstandings uh, uh, by some folks. I remember years ago, the most famous resident of Barron Springs, Michigan, was Muhammad Ali. And he came to one of my classes. And he had been taught what many Muslim brothers and sisters have been taught, and that was that that Jesus was the offspring or the literal biological child of God uh, and Mary, you know. And he said it's offensive to suggest that God had sex with Mary and that Jesus was begotten, you know. In mm -hmm. fact, that's not what the passage is referring to at all. It's talking about a relational connection. Uh, father and son, even these words are, are a little deceiving, but they really are pointing to a close relationship that in those ancient times was the closest relationship. The son got all the inheritance. The son had the, the privileges and the rights and the authority of the father. So this mm -hmm. idea of, of Jesus, it's not saying that he somehow God had some incest with Mary. That's blasphemy. And, and we made sure that Muhammad Ali understood that we didn't believe that. <laughs> That's not what Christianity teaches. But rather... There's a mystery here of the incarnation. When we go to the Gospel of Luke and we look at when when Mary is informed that she will bear a child, she says, how? She wants to have a biology and anatomy lesson. How is this possible? She doesn't get one. What she gets instead is who? Mm. You know, yeah, the, yeah. your son will be the savior. And that's the part I think that is far more important. There's a mystery here to be believed that we can't fully understand. Uh, mm -hmm. It takes a lot of faith and understanding uh, go together. But in this case, we have to lean pretty heavily on faith. Yeah. Uh, one of the challenges uh, that I think that John is trying to navigate here as he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to record this passage in this way is that we're trying to describe the infinite using finite. Uh, mm -hmm. We're doing the best we can to explain something that, uh, dare I say, a, a million years of 
you know, eternal happily ever after with God, with Jesus sitting at his feet and learning from him every single moment, we still won't understand all of what God is and who he is and, and everything that that uh, makes him unique and makes him truly God. And so uh, John here has to use some of these these limited languages, uh, references to things like father and son, the idea of only begotten. Um, it's just finite language to understand something uh, using the best uh, the best words that we have available. And I, I'm sure it'll take a, a an eternity of lessons before we even catch a glimpse of of what this relationship truly looks like. Another aspect of John's gospel is a lot of dualisms, and we see one here in verse 3, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. That kind of points towards the surprise, perhaps, that God comes on this rescue mission, and the very people he's come to save reject him. You know, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. Uh, it goes on in verse uh, Nine to say that was the very light that gives light to every man who comes into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Verse 10, verse 11, mm -hmm. he came to his own and his own did not receive him. What is this pointing to in John's gospel? What, what is this idea of here comes the savior, the rescuer? Mm -hmm. And what are we So what I see. So what I see here is not only a glimpse of what is unfortunately to come, uh, a, a forewarning, because John's prologue here does introduce themes that are uh, that we are about to see as we read through the story. But unfortunately, it's also a reflection of everything we've read thus far through our Bibles. As we've read through the Old Testament, everything that God has done to try to reveal himself to his people and they they run out and make golden calves and and they slaughter the prophets and and uh, time and time again try, God is trying to draw His people closer to them but unfortunately there's people who just don't accept it uh, for whatever reason it doesn't kick into their into their head into their heart and they just don't have this meaningful relationship with Him that He ever intended. So when I see this passage, uh, it, it's it's a reflection and a review of where we are, mm. but it's also a bit of a heads up of what we're about what, about to go through. And, and in this story, in the Gospel of John, thinking about some of the stories of Jesus doing incredible miracles, uh, some magnificent signs, and people look at that and say, he's got to be from the devil. It's just it's got to be heartbreaking for Jesus to hear these, these these reactions to to the miracles, to the teachings, to everything he's trying to do to get these people's attention. Verses 14 and following. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. And verse 16 and of his fullness, we have all received and grace for grace. Then verse uh, 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. So here we have this clarity that Jesus is revealing. He came to reveal. People today are like, how can I find God? God is hiding all these kinds of ideas. In fact, God is over and over again trying to reveal himself to us. We're the ones who are hiding, not him. And he's right. wanting us to know him. As it says in verse uh, verse 11, he came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Mm. So there's a choice that he gives with his revelation, his coming, his incarnation. Yeah, and uh, we, we've kind of uh, kind of tapped on it a little bit, but right in there, in, in between verses eleven and fourteen, uh, that those verses, verses twelve and thirteen, uh, that's something uh, I. I've seen a few people actually argue is the the heart of this passage. If you want to look at it from a, a literary standpoint, if you have a chiastic structure, uh, I've seen people who say that verses 12 and 13 are the, the, the whole point of, of this prologue. And it says, but as many as received him to him, he gave the right to become the children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so when I look at this passage and at this idea, uh, people who are not born by blood or the or flesh or the will of man, uh, 
this, of course, you know, these are statements of biology, but John isn't concerned about the biology as much as he is about the spirituality. Uh, it, this is a, an argument that Nicodemus will wrestle with later with the idea of being born again. Uh, and uh, when you deal with John chapter three, but this idea of God is giving you this, these opportunities. God's making these revelations to you. He's calling to you. And how do you respond to it? Uh, and that's where uh, that's where many people will, will see in this passage, but also throughout the gospel, that when John does his, his, when John tells his story, there's a lot of references to faith, but never in the noun form. It's not a, it's not just something you can have. It's, it's not just a static thing. It's always in the verb form, uh, mm -hmm. 98 references to faith. And it's always in the verb form. And, and as I, I work with middle schoolers, I have to remind them, what is a verb? Well, a verb is an action. And so when I look at this this passage, this call from John and, and ultimately from Jesus, you have this call uh, not just to have faith, but to do something with it and put your faith in action. And so that's that's the challenge that we have is how do we respond to the truth, to the revelation, to the light, to everything that God is giving us? What do we do in response? Let's read those verses again. As you said, they're the very heart uh 12 and 13, we have the negative side on verse 11. He came to mm -hmm. his own, his own did not receive him. But then there is a positive, hallelujah for that. But as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become children of God to those who were born in his name. Uh, it's interesting. The other day I was pondering, actually, the fact that Jesus is born makes it possible for us to be reborn. Hmm. You know, if Jesus had never been born, we could never have a, a rebirth, a conversion experience. He had to come. He had to carry our sins. He had to go through the cross, which I wish we had time to talk about is the glory in the Gospel of John. But this right. idea of belief and unbelief, it just keeps coming up over and over again. And it's really right, right at the heart of it here. So we have a choice. And the most important decision in our lives is what are we going to do with Jesus? Yeah. It is, it, it, it's a challenge for us. And one of the things I do appreciate is, you know, at the beginning of this quarterly uh, or the beginning of the studies in the gospel of John, we were, we were encouraged with the, the notes where John says, there's a lot of stories that were out there about Jesus hmm. found in Matthew and Mark. And there's other stories out there, but I picked these ones specifically so that you may believe. Yeah. Those are references at the end of John chapter 20, John chapter 21. It, it's once again, these the stories that we find as we get into our studies in the Gospel of John, these ones are about it's not just Jesus and, and having good head knowledge, but it's how is your how is it impacting your heart? How is it impacting your life? And I, you know, I I look through these stories of people who see these miracles, get to firsthand experience some of these miracles. And really, it's not just the re they're experiencing miracles. They get to encounter the miracle worker in, in a very special and unique way. And, and so I appreciate them sharing their testimony with us because testimony can be such a, a profound impact and a profound witness uh, of just how awesome God is uh, for them. And it's that same God who wants to work for us. What would we want to say in summary, as we look at this prologue, uh, what are things that we can be sure of? Uh, what does this tell us about Jesus? How would you summarize it? What would be key points for us to hold on to? Because there's a lot of ideas of who Jesus is and what he was and what he wasn't. And but there's some clear things. The Gospel of John here does not begin in a vague way saying, well, I'm not sure if Jesus was divine or anything like that. He is the divine preexistent part of the Godhead. That's mm -hmm. one clear fact, right? Yep. Yep. Definitely see uh, you made reference to it in verse one, verse 18. He is he is with God. He is God. OK, what else would we want to say about Jesus as a human? Well, Jesus definitely was a man. He was God in flesh. He came to this earth to reflect God and his glory and his truth to us. He wasn't just a, uh, he wasn't just a, another um, angel, for example. He, he was one of us. So he didn't just take on some kind of human-like 
quality. He became human. He yeah. got hungry. He got tired. He he sorrowed. There, you know, the humanness of Jesus was was there throughout all the Gospels. Okay, now what does this say about our response? Obviously, the the challenge is how do we how do we want to react to Jesus? How do we how do we feel compelled to Jesus? And in that way, many of us feel like we're in the dark. Many of us are struggling because we are in the darkness of not being able to as as later audience. We didn't get to walk with Jesus. We didn't get to see these miracles firsthand. We're only catching them through John's accounts and and through other uh, through other stories in the Bible. So in some regards, we're in the dark, but we're thankful that this light has come. And the only question is, what are we going to do? Are we going to choose to willingly remain in the dark as the the dark as as the light wants to chase the darkness away? It comes down to personal decision, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, Michael, if I could just ask on a personal level, what is it meant in your life that you have met Jesus? God, who became the incarnate Savior of this world, and Michael Taylor. <laughs> it was half a lifetime ago that I encountered Jesus. I was in my early years of college, and I'll tell you, I really struggled with that, with that sense of darkness. I struggled with a lack of purpose, a lack of, of direction and meaning for my life. And uh, getting to know God has really clarified for me uh, that purpose isn't just, uh, isn't just an abstract idea. Mm. It's a person. It's this relationship that my life is now centered around and gives my life direction and meaning. And I may not understand every step along the way, and I might not have all the answers of everything, but I know the one who has come to reveal the truth of himself and who he made me to be. And so it has definitely transformed my life, given me a hope that I never thought was possible, and uh, has definitely given me the direction that I, I, I have had to respond to. Well, thank you so much for that testimony, Michael. Uh, we're grateful to Michael Taylor for being our guest today. We want to remind each of you that uh, next time in Scripture Pursuit, we'll keep exploring this gospel according to John. So join us again next time. But until then, today and every day, may we continue to pursue the God of the Scriptures. This is Scriptural Pursuit with your host, Glenn Russell.